All right, so graphing square roots and other radical functions. We were where? That, put that. Take the transformation. So we went ahead and did the parent functions and transformations in the way we went down that one. Oh, yep, we're right at the word problem. That's where we're at. And this is the one you're going to want graphing calculated for. Uh, when we get to large numbers and, and word problems involving the radicals, that's exactly what the calculator is for, the stuff that we ne wouldn't necessarily want to do by hand. So this one says we can model the population P of Corpus Christi, Texas between the years 1970 and 2005 by that wonderful little radical function that we see here, 75,000 cubed roots of X minus 1950, where X is the year. Now. I've noticed something that they typically don't do here. They didn't do a zero year. And I know that because they've got this X minus 1950 in there. So for the years, they're saying, we're not going to change it this time. We're not going to say, hey, 1950 is a zero year. We're going to actually put that monster right in there. So that's going to change our window when we set this. And that's something we need to notice. Otherwise, we're going to be hitting zoom six and going, where's the graph? So. Where, where X is the year? Using this model, in what year was the population of Corpus Christi 250,000? Well, this is population, so they want to know 250,000 equals 75,000 cubic roots of X minus 1950. Now, it's not that we couldn't solve this. We could. But what we really want to get used to now is that these large numbers, they can be solved graphically. And it's the same way we can solve any equation where we put 1 in as y sub 1. And I typically like to put the one that has a little more meat to it as y sub 1. And then the other one is y sub 2. Although it wouldn't make any difference at all which one you make y sub 1 and which one you make y sub 2. So we go into y equals. And we're going to put in 75,000 cube roots. That's under math. And it is number four. So you can either hit four or you can uh, scroll down like I just did. And then we want x minus 1950. And I need to finish off those parentheses because then the graphing calculator knows, hey, this is all the stuff that's underneath the radical right here. And then on the other side, we want 250,000. All right, we have to change the window. We have to. And that's because, remember, it said that X is the year. And they're asking us about 1970 to 2005. So we'll go under window. And, yeah, we'll just stick to 1970. But if in 2005 that's the model, it's going to probably take a little while to get us to 250,000. So maybe we'll try 1,020 or something that we and then the y values, well, y is p of x. So you think, well, what's p of x stand for? It's population. They want to know when is it 250,000. So I wouldn't need to start at zero, but I just have to make sure I can see 250,000. So maybe I'll go to 300,000 to make sure I get enough. Got enough zeros there? Yep. And graph. So there's our cube root. And there's our 250,000. Pretty obviously, they're hitting each other. So we'll do second trace. And we'll let Blinky do his job. Number five, intersect. And enter one, two, three times. And I look at that Blinky says sometime during 1987. It will be 250,000. So it's a good thing that's one of our answers up here. C. Well, like I said, it's not that we couldn't have solved this by hand. It's just really nice to have it in there and calculate when these numbers are really large like they are here. And then the next one, the God, it says, in what year was the population of Corpus Christi 275,000? Go to it. Change the one number you need to change in here and let me know what year.
make yourself a button. Let's just raise your hand. We have to be able to see at least 275 dollars and I don't know why it's but I'll just kind of spread it out a little bit more. Okay, what year? Those of you that have it already? Sometime during? 1999. Sometime during 1999. So let me go through the steps if anybody's stuck. Should be able to just change this one to 275,000. Graph it looks very similar to what we saw before. But our line should be a little higher this time. Second trace, number five, bing, bang, boom. Sometime during 1999, we will get our 275,000. Cool. It's always amazing to me how you, a few hits of the button and this thing has the answer, you know. Um, and again, for large numbers, that's really what we want to do is just grab that. Now, you might want to at least shut it off. That sucks up a lot of battery, battery power for the graphic calculator to do two hits in a row. So what we're going to do now is figure out how do we do our graphic procedures the way that we've always done them, but with cube root. You know, how do we get the parent function and then just use h and k to count? And cube root is just as basic as square root is. It is not a big deal at all. So problem four uses a transformation of y equals the cube root of x. The function f of x equals the cube root of x is the inverse of g of x equals x cubed. Whatever we do, we have to be able to undo. Unlike y equals the square root of x, the domain and range are all real numbers. <coughs> what are they talking about? Domain and range, all real numbers. Well, remember, when you talk about inverses, the domain and range of the original flip flop when you talk about the domain and range of the inverse. But with cube root, we can take the cube root of positive and negative numbers just as if we're raising them to the third power, we can raise any number to the third power. There's no need to restrict. With square root, we always had to make sure that if we're staying in the real number system, that the square root of x minus h, well, x minus h always had to be greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, we were in imaginary land. That's not the case with cube root. We can take whatever we need to. Of cube root. So the answer to domain and range of any cube root problems is all real numbers. All real numbers. So the patterns for graphing square roots apply to other radical functions. And that means we can just graph the parent function and do some counting. Works for me. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, there's my parent right there. I don't take h and k with for parent functions. That's the moving, that's the translation. But I'm going to need to get y equals 2 cube roots of x. To start with, I want to know what are the parent numbers just for y equals the cube root of x. So we started by doing all of that with square root, and they're kind of skipping that step, and that's not okay. We need to say, all right, is there a standard x and y that we should be using when we graph the cube root of x? And the answer is, yeah, we should. What we should do is we should think between negative 10 and 10, there have to be some perfect cubes on this that are going to make it easy for us to graph. And there are. There's negative 8, there's negative 1, there's 0, 1, and there's 8. Those are perfect cubes. And those are nice. We don't want to have to figure out the cube root of 2. That is not nice. These would be wonderful because this will be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So those are our, our standard 
parent function for the cube root of x. But now we'll have to take that, and in this problem we'll have to multiply it by 2, because we have an a value that's not standard. So we start just like we did with our square roots by saying, okay, if this were just the cube root of x, that's what I would use. But it's not. This one has a 2 in front. So that means all we have to do is take our y values and multiply them by 2. And that gives us those. And that's the shape of our graph. So negative 8, negative 4, negative 1, negative 2, 0, 0, 1, 2, and 8, 4. And we see them as symmetry. Now remember, when you graph when you graph quadratics, we're always getting a parabola. And really, our square roots are the inverse, the reflection of that in y and y equals x. With this one, we're trying to get the inverse of an S-curve. Well, the inverse of an S-curve is an S-curve. It's just not going to go vertical anymore. It's going to go horizontal. So this is our shape for our graph. A sideways S-curve. Sideways snake-like curve. Then we just need to move it. So we're going to switch colors. But I'll give you a second here because some of you may have to grab it something on the bag to do this way because we want our final and just like I'm doing this in classes how I expect you to do this when we take the test where you have a paired function and then you show that you just counted to get the new position so you'll always have at least two sketches for me this is the helper can't be solid anything that's a helper in math has to be dashed or dotted and then all we're going to do is move it according to those two numbers so where are we moving this graph So you're counting left one and down four, or down four and left one. Have you try try to make the smooth curve. I know it's kind of hard when you first learn a new graph to you know, just try to make it a smooth curve as you go through there. We're done already. That's it. Now I know they didn't do this, but we're going to. We're going to add domain and range to this problem because it's going to take us all of two seconds. What's the domain? All reals. Going right and left forever. What's the range? doesn't seem to be going up too fast, and it doesn't seem to be going down too fast. The speed doesn't matter. It's still all real. It's still get there. We just have to continue on a lot, you know? So it will be all reals. All right. They're already messing with our heads. What is up with that? That's not in the right format. It's supposed to be y equals a cube root of x minus h plus k. Oh, not a big deal to get it that way, though, is it? Where are we going to put the three? Just put it in the back. It's a positive three. You always take the sign that's in front of it. So now we're going to get our parent. We're going to make a table. And then we're going to count to get the new positions. And I'm going to get you a candy bar. So get started on that. <laughs> Negative one half is a reflection over the x-axis and a compression. Um, everybody at one time, tell me how you move this right or left. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? So right or left was right two. How'd you move it up or down? Up three. Is it difficult to remember that h has to be backwards from where you are? 
Is that coming pretty naturally by now? Yeah, we've done H and K so long that um, we just look up there and say, hey, it's the opposite of, of what I see. Well, good job, everybody. I heard some really good conversations there. So now, big old oval here. What's this big old oval for? It says, we can graph functions of the form. Now, this is kind of small. Y equals the nth root of bx plus c. Uh-oh. That doesn't look anything like what we were doing before. We can graph this using transformations if we can simplify the radicand. Simplify the radicand. Okay, because here's the problem. There's not supposed to be a B in front of that X. That can't be there for us to use our A, H, and K. So we have to figure out how to get that out of there. So that is a really ugly looking little monster right there. But it is super close to what we have done in the past. It is. If we can just figure out how to get that B out, we'll have this. Well, and let's see what they want us to do. This says, how could we rewrite this little monster so that we could graph it using our transformations? Because they're so nice and easy. I mean, if we can get it that way, why not? So I rewrite it, and I think for a second. Gosh, it's at 9. Just get rid of that. If I could just get rid of that, this would be OK. We just have to think about factoring it out. That's something we haven't done a lot of. But we have been doing it when we simplify square roots. We pull it apart. That's what we need to do here. So if we do that, it's going to look like that. How come? The square roots can be multiplied by other square roots. So if we divide out a square root, it's going to work. If we distributed this back through, everybody can see it'll be square root of 9x plus the square root of 18. And, and we can do that with brackets. We can do it with absolute value. Or it, there's a lot of things that we can do with factoring. And then we know what the square root of 9 is. That's 3. And we're only going to use the positive 3 because when they gave us the original problem, we need to think of this as, okay, this is the principal root. They didn't say plus or minus. They just said, hey, leave this. And then it says, describe the graph. Well, our parent would be y equals the square root of x. So what they're asking us is, what does the 3 do? And what does the 3 do? And what does the 3 do? Vertical stretch, factor of 3. And how about that plus 2 on here? That's like left 2. That's not new. That's not new. Describing the transformations is something we've been doing ever since the first chapter. It really is. So if we can factor that out, we want to do that. So in 6a, here's what they want us to do. They want us to take something really ugly. And make that y equals a cubed roots of x minus h plus k, and then describe the transformation. That's for you and your partner. Take a minute. Describe that transformation to your partner. Describe what the 2 out in front is going to do, the plus 4 under the radical is going to do, and the minus 2 in the back. Okay, I heard lots of overlapping conversations about that vertical stretch by a factor of 2. How about the 4? What was that? Left 4? <coughs> and say left 4 units and 
What about the minus two in the back? So if we can just get it in this A, H, and K form, then it's everything we've done before. Now B, look at what they just did. They switched gears on us. It says describe the graph of Y equals the absolute value of 9X plus 18 by rewriting it in that form. And how is that similar to Y equals the square root of 9X plus 18? Problem six. Ooh, let's talk about that one. Questions that I want you to discuss with your partner. Hopefully, without having to graph this on your graphing calculator, because it's been a while since we did these. I want you to tell your partner what the shape of that graph is. Some of you remembered the V shape right away. All right, so it is, it's a V. Absolute value is always a V. Now, tell them what the 9 is going to do to that V. Tell your partner what that 9 will do. Really tall and skinny V, right? So how about the plus 2? Tell your partner what that plus 2 is going to do. So here's what I want you to visualize. We're at 0, 0. We move 2 to the left. So now we're at negative 2, 0, and make a really skinny V, going almost straight up. That's that graph. You know? So without actually graphing it on the graphing calculator or graphing it ourselves, we can get a really good look at what this is going to be. So this is very similar to what we're doing when we're factoring out those square roots and those cube roots. We want an A value in front. We want an H where we know it's supposed to be and a K where we know it's supposed to be. And then it makes it really super graphing or even just visualizing in your head what they're going to be. So, let's see. I think we're done. So let me ask you, 43210, how are you feeling about graphing cube groups? Because that was our objective this last one. It was just for fun. Alright, looking good. Thank your partner for their wonderful help. <laughs> And yeah, you're probably going to want graph paper if you are a person that likes to use graph paper for this. Because now we're graphing cube roots. But if you square roots still mixed in there. Did you say cups? Did you say cups? Alright. Joey, you like that? Alright. What? Can you look at that? Mm -hmm. I probably heard you say that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.